UW Literacy Conference for the year 2015. It's with great pleasure that I would like to introduce you to our ring of sunshine, Dr. Ray Reitzel. I told Ursula she could be very creative. She missed her opportunity to really get me. Well, on behalf of the College of Education, faculty, staff, and administration, we, it is my pleasure to welcome you this evening to the 2015 University of Wyoming College of Education Literacy Conference. As you know, my name is Dean Ray Reitzel, and I have the distinct pleasure of serving as the Dean of the College of Education at the University of Wyoming. And uh, we're very fortunate in the next few hours and in all day tomorrow to have with us some very distinguished speakers from across the nation and some wonderful presenters from in our own midst that will provide breakout sessions for all of the participants in the conference. I would like to thank you for choosing to come and attend this conference. I know that you have other choices as the airlines very often remind us. Um, but we're glad you made this choice. And uh, I hope that when you're done, that you won't just enjoy the experiences you had here for yourselves, but that you will share them with others, and next year, bring a buddy. Invite someone to come with you, and, and share the wealth with the people through the state, so that our conference here at the University of Wyoming can continue to grow and influence, through its outreach, all the members of our state. Now, so then, what is literacy? Let us consider the word. The term literacy has been used for many years in a fairly narrow sense to refer to a set of print processing, print-based decoding, encoding, rudimentary thinking skills necessary to remember or process text. Nowadays, our understanding of literacy has been broadened, so much so that one of my colleagues in the field of literacy and educational linguists by the name of David Bloom at Ohio State University has raised the somewhat impertinent question, has the term literacy outlived its usefulness? Pointing to a recent Amazon.com book title search, Dr. Bloom created a taxonomy of 72 plus literacies found in his book title search. Take a look on the next slide as an illustration from my little foray today. What do we have here? Oh, we have literacies of power, global literacies, kitchen literacy, vegetable literacy, <laughs> health literacy from A to Z, visual, and it went on. So now we understand literacy to be everything from the visual and analytical to a whole host of technological skills necessary for us to acquire information from digital video, handheld data assistance, computers, wireless reading devices, cell phones, and other technological learning devices. For all of us, this new definition of literacy and literacies might be somewhat challenging. For example, what must young children who are often, often called digital natives thinking about the following two slides? It's a library, honey. Kind of an early version of the World Wide Web. Or, today we're looking at ancient artifacts. <laughs> well, I, I have to say I'm a user of those ancient artifacts still. Now, some of my colleagues in, say, areas of adolescent literacy working in a field of identity literacy would claim, given the broadened definition of literacy, that the following slides also an example of literacy. So, as you participate in this conference, this may be a time for a really interesting discussion of the word literacy. How it's defined, what it means, how it gets used, who has power to use it, etc. Is the term literacy, as David Bloom suggested, becoming merely a synonym for the concept of communication? Is there anything apart 
from the concept of communication that makes literacy unique? And if so, what is it? What would we argue that literacy deserves to have as its definition, its boundaries, as opposed to the word communication? How will it continue to be useful to society and in education if we continue to broaden this term to just mean communication? To me, this is an interesting question. Maybe it will be for you to talk about in the hallways. Now, as far as the multimodal nature of literacy for Abby to find is concerned, there's a little debate that there are many skills that are needed for acquiring information in today's information society. And those skills and strategies and abilities are expanding exponentially. Students are challenged to use new technology and literacy skills shaped by increasingly diverse social and cultural settings found in schools, homes, communities, businesses, groups, and other places such as virtual social settings like wikis, naming social networks and blogs. I like this cartoon. I appreciate, I appreciate the text, Kate, but next time you can just raise your hand. In this brave new world of multimodal literacy, the term encompasses the learning of a complex set of strategies, skills, concepts, abilities, and knowledge, enabling individuals to understand visual print-based information presented in a variety of media and using a variety of technological formats. The goal, then, of literacy instruction is to empower readers to learn, grow, and participate in a vibrant, rapidly changing information-based world. So just go to www.criticalthinking.com and click on the answers. <laughs> Learning to read and write are not simple tasks and can be a struggle for many children not to mention adults who must relearn these skills. In her book titled, My Stroke of Insight, Dr. Jill Bolton-Taylor, a highly recognized neurologist, documented her difficulty in recovering after a severe stroke at age 38, the ability to read and write. For her, regaining this ability, she said in her book, was the most difficult set of things she had to relearn after suffering her stroke. So let us not underestimate the difficulty of what we are asking young people to do. And apparently it's not only difficult for those who suffer from strokes, but also for technology, too. I found the problem, Phil, your spell checker had a nervous breakdown. As children and adolescents begin the difficult, multifaceted process of learning to read using a variety of multimodal inputs, they need to acquire a set of skills, concepts, and strategies with the help and guidance of effective teachers and engaged parents. Somewhat like this poor parent here who apparently lost their Wi-Fi connection. In order to effectively read efficiently and purposefully, learners must skillfully comprehend text conceptually integrate information constructed from text and images into their world knowledge network, and strategically solve real-world real world problems with print, whether presented in traditional formats or in technological formats. On the way to reaching the ultimate goal of reading comprehension, that is, constructing the author's message and one's own message using what they have learned from text for discovery and learning in novel situations. <clears throat> it is my hope that your attendance at this conference will enable you to return home to your various professional settings filled with new ideas, understandings, and competencies to effectively help the next generation of readers, writers, learners, and leaders to become literate in the fullest sense of whatever that term means to you. <clears throat> my best wishes are that this conference will be fulfilling and enlightening, an experience that you will cherish as you attend this year's University of Wyoming Literacy Conference. Thank you for coming.
Okay. We're, we've got a panel discussion uh, for you now, and as we're getting ready to do this, we can deep six the screen so that we can. Oh, we have to. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you to do something. There's only so much time you can spend on your seat. So you need to get up and move. If you're sitting, if you're not sitting by somebody that you do not know. So my guess is that most of you are sitting near somebody who came from your school. Move, please. We feel like this particular no fan, you have to move so you're not sitting close to somebody you know. Find a stranger and make a friend. Last 21 years of the UW Lab School, fourth and fifth grade. 
Fourth and fifth grade might be your years. Wow. I'm Bridget Dalton from the University of Colorado Boulder. And I'm Vicki Gillis, which I probably should have told you earlier. Um, <laughs> and I'm a faculty member here at UW. My field is disciplinary literacy. So we have, we're going to start this off with some questions, and we're going to ask you to buzz among yourselves, and then we'll kind of chime in. The first thing is, and I think Ray really set this up nicely, um, what is reading? What do we mean by reading? Take a minute or two, talk, turn to a neighbor, and buzz among yourselves while we collect our thoughts, and then we'll, we'll chime in too. <laughs> which I'm sure we'll talk about tonight. That's what my definition would be. So, constructing me. Mm -hmm. From anything? From anything. So, if I'm watching a football game tomorrow, sur surreptitiously on my cell phone. <laughs> um, which you won't be, because we have a really great conference going on. I know, but between <laughs> sessions, I'll check the scores. That's reading. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so you have kind of the reading the world perspective, um, and I do agree that we read and interpret and make sense of. We're as human beings, we're sense readers, and so we're, we make sense from whatever is available to us. But um, as a literacy teacher and researcher, I'm interested in reading in relation to multimodal um, contexts that include often some written language. But I certainly agree in principle that when you deconstruct or read a painting, uh, I think it's the term reading. Uh, certainly you make, you make sense of it and you emotionally engage. And even because I do work in multimodality, people often ask me, well, does it have to include words? Um, and I go back and forth in my answer to that. Uh, because sometimes if it's an image that's a response to listening or reading to a, a piece of literature, um, the image is certainly um, a symbol system that we all know how we interpret and communicate. Um, so. So I guess my answer is that I'm not quite sure for myself. Mm -hmm. Well, so Bridget, because it is so complex, right? Mm -hmm. So as we're talking, I'm thinking about the tradition of picture books where the meaning doesn't come only from the words or the image. Right. The meaning has to come from your ability to do both. So it it is so complex, and I, I guess I come to think, well, first of all, it has to be constructing meaning, right? It can't be anything less than that. But I guess it depends on when and where and who, and what's at stake. 
So how would it really vary as a function of what's at stake? Well, if I go into a museum and I can't make sense of a piece of art, I'm probably not going to be hurt by it. I might be embarrassed, but I probably won't be hurt by it. But if I go into an office and I can't read an application, I'm going to be hurt by it. So that's what I'm thinking. Or a stop sign. Or, or stop something sign. along those lines. Um, that's but a really you, interesting point of context. But if you can't read the word stop, but you can read the shape of the sun and see that it's red if you're not colorblind, mm -hmm. are you still reading? I'll jump in here because visual literacy is something that fascinates me. Um, and the, the idea, um, as Dr. Milky does, I, I work in the field of children's literature, and, and as Jeannie mentioned as well, um, in picture books. And I, I harken back to the wordless picture books. You know, I work with very young children, and we have this tendency to think that, you know, wordless picture books are only the realm of the very young pre-readers um, who don't yet read text. Um, However, I would argue that, in fact, wordless picture books are extraordinarily sophisticated um, pieces that, that do require an ability to read the images in order to, to construct that meaning, to get meaning from them, and to create meaning um, as well, to share that, that message that you know, the way that I have viewed these, these pictures or this series of pictures may be different than, than my colleague has. Um, or my granddaughter has. Um, so I think that there are, there are multiple ways of reading, and, and visual is absolutely one of those. To take that thought a little bit further into media literacy and how do we read between the lines and interpret the subtext of the message, which gets back to Dr. Milky's original definition. Let me throw a little gasoline on the fire, and I say that because I know Steve is sitting right down there, and he's like, hold to get up and disagree with me here, but... So if you're saying that if you, if you, if there's something even visual that you construct meaning from, if I'm a defensive lineman, and I'm looking at that offensive lineman's hands, and I notice that his knuckles are white, and because I know he's leaning forward, I know what kind of play this is going to be, and therefore I have gotten meaning out of that, and I know what my job is. Is that reading? Yes. You think? I, I would say yes. Um, but I think another way to complicate this maybe is to um, save our discussion of what is reading for a second and talk about what is text. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. Why don't, why don't you in the audience take about a minute and a half and buzz with each other about what text is? How do you even set a timer for you? <laughs>
So it's always, you are reading something. So it, only teachers and educators ask the question, what is reading? <laughs> People in real life don't do that. So it's whether I'm reading a book, and, or reading tea leaves, or reading your mind, or reading my text messages. Or reading the signals of the football. Uh, right. I mean, and so it's really important. When you say what's reading, it's also not a fair question. Because, like I said, it's a transitive verb, and it always requires you to read something else. Something. That was what I had to say. And that's maybe where I was going with the idea of what is text. It was <laughs> not. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Steve. <laughs> well, I'll jump in. Uh, I think text is the words that are on the page, uh, or on anything that read and um, from my experience with kids uh, some kids can read the text and read for deep meaning and some kids fake read they can read the text but they really don't have any idea what it means or some kids just pretend to read because they know they're supposed to be reading and uh, they think it makes them look smart, so they pick the fattest book with the most text and don't read a word, but appear to be reading. So I think text is just the words. Okay, not the meaning. Now I'm going to tag on to something you just said because you mentioned kids picking fat books because, you know, they want to appear to be reading something. My daughter, one year, who's not a scholar, um, picked the skinniest book she could find to read. Only it was Candide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, she, yes, and she found out, you know, the hard way that the skinny book is not always the hardest, the easiest thing to read. Sometimes it's really hard. But I don't, I don't know. I, I think there are folks who would say that text has to be print. So I'm not reading text when I'm reading Outlander for my Audible.com subscription. Mm, no, I don't know. I'm I'm addicted to Audible. <laughs> so, but is it reading? We got a question or a comment. <laughs> throw a monkey wrench is this. Um, what about my blind students that I have to teach Braille? Without, there is no reading of visual material because picture books make no sense. Their reading happens to be a series of dots on a page that have to be carefully guided through and understood. So it's, it's a little bit different from that point of view because and that's the way I tend to look at things. And that's Paula from the Prairie View High School? No. We, I know it was a really nice Prairie View School. I think that's an, Paula, is that, yeah. I think that's an excellent point. Um, I have a couple of former students in here, um, and we have this conversation in Children's Lit um, about what is reading for that very reason. Um, although I would guess, Bridget, maybe that you would call that a text because it's on the page. I would call it a too. Yeah. Um, and it's it's interesting as as we're talking about what is reading and what is text, um, because some would say this room is a text, this performance is a text. Basically, anywhere we're constructing meaning and interacting with language and symbols, and that it's all a text. And I, I agree with that from that perspective, but I'm a literacy teacher, and so I think about reading and text 
in the context of literacy. Now, I do expand text beyond the written word from the page, or even the book, the fixed book. So for me, um, both visual and written and audio, the sound and music, when it all works together, it's language that's being communicated, and it's um, text is no longer fixed in, in the ways that it, it, it used to be when we relied on print books. So in digital context, text is transformed, it's flexible, and it can be represented in um, lots of different ways and customized for learners. So the nature of text is really changing and expanding. Um, but um, as a literacy teacher, for me, I'm not, even though I'm reading this room and all the participants in it, and I'm interpreting the conversation, that's it. It's a different socially situated use of the word text. It is. It is. Vicki yeah. mentioned that uh, coaches talk about reading an offense or reading a defense. Mm -hmm. But that's, that is the terminology often in football. Also, a physicist reads his environment and then he codes it into mathematics. Not that I didn't mention mathematics yet. And reading mathematics is just as valid, especially since mathematics is the language of the universe. Uh, that's true, and as a former science teacher, I would say that reading a chemical reaction, we would, as a scientist, you wouldn't call it reading, but you're watching for a color change or um, gas to be produced or something like that, so that, or um, something to end, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, or precipitate or something. And so you're getting meaning from that, but a scientist wouldn't use that terminology. That's that a scientist would say, I'm going to observe this. But in fact, what you're doing is you're getting information from what you see. Diane just wanted to add, and reading music. And reading music. Yes. You know the river. Oh, and reading the river, right? Reading the river. Yes, when you're kayaking, where, where are the pillows, where are the eddies? I got you. Yeah, I can remember not being able to read that river very well. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole different story. Yeah, like water rafting and, um, oh well. <laughs> you know, I wonder a little bit about the consequences of a broad or narrow definition. Yeah. Um, and I think, again, we come back to context, that there are contexts where a very broad definition opens opportunities, but there are also contexts where a broad definition will narrow opportunities. And so, if our first, second, and third graders, or eighth, ninth, and tenth graders, leave us not being able to read the printed word well, mm -hmm. the consequences for them are dire. So I, I, on the one hand, obviously I agree with all of the, I, the, the notion of multi-texts and multi-modalities and the broadness of it, and yet I wonder a lot about the implications for us in classrooms day in and day out and, and what it all means. And I think for me, one of the questions that it raises is why do we and how do we um, and should we privilege certain kinds of texts? Um, do we do that because, do, do we privilege the, the printed text on the page um, the traditional notion of reading um, because it's easy to assess, because it's easier to assess than other types of reading or other types of text. Um, what is our purpose for doing that? Um, and what consequences then does that have for our students who don't engage in that kind of reading as readily? Um, and how can we use other less privileged forms of text and reading to help them acquire the skills that they need to have to function in a society that has certain expectations around text. 
Well, that makes me think about um, the research with the children, um, Shirley Bryce Heath's work, mm -hmm. where um, there's a child who's going to be um, tested for special ed because he didn't answer the literal questions. But in his culture, those were sort of non-questions. They were um, they were rhetorical questions because they were obvious. You know, the answers. You know, little Red Riding Hood's cape is red. You know, so what's the point of asking that question? And so I also wonder what happens not just with young children who come to school with. They're literate. They have lots of literacies that just don't match the standard, if you will, literacy in a, that's accepted in a school. I think about adolescents who, um, I remember interviewing a, a young fellow who responded to a survey that a group of us were doing. And when he responded to the survey, he said, no, he didn't read. He wasn't really a reader. He didn't like to read. And when I interviewed him, and ask the question, do you have a favorite author? Oh, I read everything Michael Crichton has ever written. Did you read it? He was off to the races. And I, I looked at his survey, and I'm listening to what he's saying, and I realized then that to kids, reading is what happens in school. It isn't what happens outside of school. So, to that point, um, and, and, and so to me, the question of what is reading is not the right question in a sense, because at least my research for the last 50, 20 years has not been so much that, but it's been um, why is it when you walk to somebody and say, What are you reading? What have you read lately? They always talk about a book. And, and, I've, and I've written and published about this, and I'm not going to get into all that. But it, it's, it's the default response. And my most recent research is going up to people in restaurants and in Denver, just in the mall, and deliberately who are texting or reading a text, or in, in a particular restaurants where I like to go and the waitresses let me do this. <laughs> I say, I give them my card, and I say, I have a couple questions, and I say, and, and they are reading the menu. I don't say, can you tell me what you've been reading lately? And they, all, and they say, well, um, something like, um, not, not much lately. So the issue, in many ways, is ideological. Mm -hmm. right? This is not, a, it's about how, uh, and, and I did a big, big old study with classroom teachers who recognize all those other literacies, but they don't count. Mm -hmm. And that's what's important. They don't count. They're not, pro they're not prototypical literacy, because as you were talking about Michael Crichton, right? So when teachers say to kids, what have you read lately? If they said to you, my text messages, you would, you would be troubled by that. My Facebook page, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And there are all sorts of reasons for that, but I think that's, to me, has always been the central issue. Why is it culturally and socially that this becomes uh, talking using your term of privileged literacy? And in fact, you know, all of us who want to talk this way, including those in the new literacy studies, would be appalled if their own kids grew up not reading books. Jim G, who I like, you know, you know, who talks about video games, trust me, his kid is reading books. <laughs> So it becomes kind of a sanctimonious conversation sometimes. You know, I, I I wonder if I wonder if the issue is is more about what counts as evidence that that maybe the concern for me anyway, and the issue is that we have a very narrow view of what counts as evidence of literacy. So you know, standardized tests and but. But if we could ever actually get to that place where there's a portfolio that with with all of these different literacies represented, mm -hmm. where you could have a broad understanding of a youngster's literacy, I feel a whole lot better about this conversation. I, I love the idea of having a broad definition. I'm just worried about the kids who 
if they don't learn to read with us, maybe aren't going to learn to read. And while I love the idea that we could change the privileged literacy, I don't think it's going to happen fast. <laughs> so I, I don't think it's going to happen fast either. And you mentioned, you know, evidence. And I think that's one of those things that makes a difference, a huge difference, not only in children being placed in classrooms and in great levels and level books and all that kind of stuff, but um, it makes a difference in disciplines because there's a different kind of evidence that's acceptable, let's say, in science versus the kind of evidence that's acceptable in mathematics. It affects, you know, the idea that when you read um, an ad for a scientifically proven reading program, that's like, um, that's like fingernails on a chalkboard for me. Because you can't prove anything scientifically. The, you know, the, the epistemology of science is you can disprove something, but you can't prove it. Because there's always a chance that around the corner is an instance that will disprove it. And so, um, and I think a lot of, a lot of the problems that we're seeing in schools stem from the fact that we're not accepting a broader variety of evidence. But I'm with you, I don't know how we get. But I think too, it, it's not an either or. No, it, it's yes. not that we, we, you know, teach one literacy and leave another literacy out, which actually in some ways I think is what is happening. We are teaching how to read the page. Are we teaching how to read the visual? Or do we wait until fifth grade to point out how photography and books makes a difference and you know all those other types of disciplined readings. Um, I think I, what I would advocate is that we start teaching visual literacies alongside word literacies. That's a better word. It, you know, it, it's that, that idea of it's not just one right way. Um, there are accepted societal ways that we do, we need to play the game. We live in reality. We need to know how to read the words. But including in that instruction how to read illustration, how to read those visuals, I think is, is where I'm kind of headed with my thoughts. And I want to actually push back a little bit on uh, Jeannie and Vicki. Um, and what you're saying in terms of you think the written word is going to continue to um, remain uh, in its privileged position. I think it's always going to have privilege, but I do think that things are moving a little faster in terms of um, expanding um, and out from the reliance on the written word. And where the particular yeah, modality where that's happening is in, in visual. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yes. I, I, and I don't disagree with you, Bridget. Okay. I, I, think mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. Because, again, thinking back to what you said about consequence, and if we look at what's happening in the world, I mean, in the world, we're uh, communicating through written language and image and sound and movement. And if we, uh, you know, when we think about what kids should know and be able to do when they leave us um, in grade 12, uh, you know, to engage and to be successful in work, in civic life, um, in your personal life, you need to be able to um, both read and produce uh, print and multimodal text. So mm -hmm. I think it's actually moving a little faster, um, perhaps. And I think the visual in particular is um, kind of the leverage, it's the, the low-hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. And I would say Australia and New Zealand are well ahead of us in this arena because they're, um, John Callum and others do wonderful work, visual literacy, not in digital context necessarily, but in picture books with first and second graders. And you know, I think that that as we move to a deeper understanding of the importance of knowledge as the differentiator, yes. that, that what differentiates high and low achieving kids very often is knowledge more than it is, you know, we've often thought of it as decoding, it's, it's knowledge. As we move to a broader understanding of knowledge as the differentiator, there are so many ways to build knowledge. 
And as we broaden our understanding of that, I think that will also help move this understanding. I, I once read um, about a book came out a couple of years ago written by uh, a college graduate who was dyslexic. And his proposition in the book was that he was labeled and was a special education student because he couldn't decode text easily. But in the new kind of world that's coming, he said, maybe those of you who learned to read easily, the letters don't slip and slide for you, he said, but I can decode images. I can see patterns in an image far better, easier, quicker than you can. And in a post typographic world, maybe you will be a special heads, and I will be, you know, in gifted and talented, which I've never been in. And I always thought that was kind of an interesting thing to think about. Well, I can tell you, I know right now that if I had to be measured on reading graphic novels, I would definitely not be in the gifted and talented, because <laughs> I cannot read graphic novels. And that's, that's something I found when I'm working with my students and my, my future teachers. Um, I taught a class um, on literature for young children this summer. And my students had a very difficult time with the idea that, that they needed to interpret the images in the picture books. Um, and so we went through a whole process. We looked at Molly Bang's work. Um, we looked a little bit at some of the stuff that Frank Serafini has done. But really what I got them doing is thinking about the illustrations as, as art, which of course terrified them. They're like, but I'm not an artist. Um, but we broke it down into those smaller elements and talked about well, what does it mean you know, when, when you've got a thick line versus a thin line, or a diagonal line versus um, a straight line. What, what meaning are you making from this? What does it tell you? And by breaking it down into those smaller chunks, then it made it a lot easier to to interpret, to understand those visual images, um, and then to pair them with text and see how the two things work together or how they didn't work together. Um, and by the time we were done with the course, they they walked away sort of shaking their heads, thinking, "I never knew there was so much to know." And and it was very eye opening for them. And I think that. That's something they're going to be able to take with them then into their future classrooms for those kids that are very much more visually oriented because that's where our society is headed. Um, it's not really already there um, in terms of, you know, we're, just, we're constantly bombarded with, with images. And, and so making that meaning that reading those pictures um, takes on a whole different uh, level of meaning. I'm curious how many international travelers we have in the audience on the panel. I now know what sortie means after the French travel person glared at me because I asked. But I also went to South Africa. Anybody know how many national languages they have in South Africa? Fourteen. Fourteen national languages. So how are they going to communicate across the country? I've been asked how to communicate across the country, too. <laughs> Well, you know, we can go to Georgia and you might know, that's true, that's true. When we were in Cape Town, when my group was in Johannesburg, you relied on the pictures around you to interpret. Now, of course, there was one image that we really think they were trying to throw the baby off the train. We're still not sure what that one meant. <laughs> but it was an amazing exercise in visual literacy and in communication. And what does it mean to be a world traveler? And it was such a rich experience. But I also want to challenge everybody to think, what does it look like when you blend the visual literacy with the reading literacy with the media literacy? Because if we treat these as separate entities, we're segregating them. Why don't we buzz with each other about how you might blend these particular the print, the visual, the multimodal literacies? And I'll put a time on it. 
blending that uh, all those multiple modalities together. That is just really neat. And I, I want to know the source of that story too because I have a granddaughter and I want her to <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else want to respond to that? Yeah, does anybody else? Right, well, maybe I kind of want to respond to that. Oh, okay. Y'all want to hug in? Yeah, <laughs> I think it, it under, what you're doing underscores exactly what we're trying to get all of our students to do, no matter what age, and that's to think critically about what is coming in, whether it's through their eyes or their ears. And, and that idea of getting them to understand how all of these modes work to make us think in certain ways is the key element. So and how they cool. position us as readers, as listeners, as citizens, because because that does. And it, you're beginning then to teach them about persuasion and argumentation, which of course is common core. Um, and I bet that your students, even your reluctant readers, were probably a little more motivated and engaged, weren't they? <laughs> Because you've tapped into those multi-modalities. Um, so those kids that maybe aren't as, as proficient in reading um, print-based text had another opportunity to make meaning in a different way that then helped them to make meaning from, from the print as well. And the reverse is probably true as well. So that's fantastic. What else, what else did you say? Other comments? <laughs> Um, one of the things we were talking about here is exactly what you just said, Jen, that um, if we focus solely on the print text, then we lose that engagement factor. We don't get to bring kids in through whatever means, right? Whatever means we can to get them engaged. And so for me, it's about making sure that they're interested and something piques their interest. And there's something about visuals that does that a lot more the print text, at least at first. Thanks, Leslie. That reminds me of one of my absolutely most favorite TED Talks in the world is about the superpower of media literacy and why kids latch onto it because it means something outside of school. Uh huh. And so that they're decoding what they're reading and what they're seeing, and it applies to them not in school. It's the Michael Crichton factor, if you will. So that is the power of what? This media case. literacy. Okay. Well, and I think it's also the power of bringing outside of school, inside of school. So, so for so many kids, what they see in school has nothing to do with what they see outside of school. So, you know, I, I'm struggling a bit with this because I don't ever think, I think it's all of these things brought into the classroom. And so I, I love this example because for me it brings me back to that notion of multiple kinds of evidence. And if if you can prove that a child is thinking critically through that example, that just has to be fed into the profile. Mm -hmm. and, and it makes teachers' jobs so much more complicated, right? Because we keep multiplying what we're asking teachers to do. They never take yeah. anything out of the curriculum. No, they're, they're very no, happy to no. add it. We just keep adding it. In. But it seems to me that we've had over the past like 14 years now a great emphasis on passing the standardized test. And uh, it has had, I think it's had a great big influence on how we teach and how uh, the curriculums that we adopt. And in fact, right here in Laramie, we adopted uh, core curriculums implemented with fidelity for eight years, something like that. I went to observe in some of the schools that implemented that. And what it looked like was the teacher reading the script word for word, and the student, and then the teacher modeling the right answer and then the teacher to engage the children would say, my turn, she would tell the answer, your turn, and the kids in unison on her cue would give the answer back. And I witnessed kids raising their hands and wanting to discuss what was being read, and there was no discussion because there wasn't time they had to uh, do it with fidelity so that every section was timed, and that wasn't in the script. And I think that's turned a lot of kids off to reading and to 
They equate reading with drudgery and with uh, no meaning and no discussion. But on that, I just want to tell you about one thing that I did in my fourth and fifth grade classroom that I think brought together a lot of multi-modes, and that was exploration, um, student exploration research project presentations. Mm -hmm. And I had to teach them. I had to teach them every step of the way. I had to teach them how to take one sentence apart and read deeply and really understand what they're reading. And then how to uh, take notes on their reading in their own words and, and organize their notes under category headings. And after we did it as a group, they did it with a partner and they had to work together and collaborate and read books and read internet sources and watch videos and take information out of those. And then they had to put together a presentation they had to synthesize all their stuff that they took apart and put it together to make a presentation. And they had to make a PowerPoint, which is very visual. And then they had to speak it and talk it. And then after they did it with a partner, they went home and chose a topic of their own choice and did the whole process by themselves. And they are amazing. And those kids are so involved in what they're doing, so engaged, and they can't wait to present, but they'll put in the two months of hard labor to do it, which requires a lot of reading, a lot of research, a lot of writing, a lot of uh, putting together PowerPoint presentation, speaking without reading anything to us, just speaking the information, and the kids in the audience are learning all this stuff about all these topics that I could never prepare. It's, it's amazing, it's way better than the scripted core program. <laughs> I just want to say that scripted core program is also stultifying for teachers. Yeah. And I mean, how can we stay motivated and invested in, in our professional lives as teachers and literacy teachers when we're being asked uh, yeah, to teach like that? So it, it's not just the children who are suffering, teachers are suffering as well. Maybe I'd like to add, this is the anthropologist and maybe it doesn't have to be. That those stilted programs versus those kind of creating multi creative multimodal programs that you got multimodal literacy programs. This is a this is a social class issue as well. Because what we tend to find in this country are the, the, the micromanaged in the old days it was called DISTAR, it's called Mastery Learning Now, but all the sort of you know open court kind of programs you almost find almost exclusively in poor neighborhoods. Because the, the belief is those kids don't have structure at home. They can do all that stuff later, but right now they have to have the basics. Meanwhile, the kids in talking about the privilege, not privilege tax, just privileged people. People in privileged areas get the sort of interesting creative multimodal literacy. And anybody needs to read Gene Anion's work from along the 1980s to know how this is still playing out in 2015. And all kids should have this that, kind of opportunity. Well, except that they, they don't. Yeah, but they should. That's what I'm saying. Well, in fact, I, I had uh, kids in my room who were learning disabled and couldn't read, you know, barely, like first grade level, and I had emotionally disturbed kids who are basically on their way to residential treatment who came around and loved school because but, of things yeah. like that. Yeah, but I would say even in the small district of Albany County, that plays out that way, to be perfectly honest. In terms of who it, the program the, 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 the program you talked about started eight years ago, you have to think about where those programs began, which schools those were targeted towards. Not, not the last school. Well, and does that come back to uh, Ease of assessment, so to speak, in those types of schools and well, teacher responsibility. I mean, it, it comes down to people having beliefs about poor people who are usually people of color and, yeah. and, and this imagined notion of what their lives are like at home. I think what's this really is, interesting if, um, is has anyone ever seen the entire reading curriculum K 12 for New Zealand? It's 12 pages long, the entire curriculum because they trust their teachers to teach what needs to be taught. It's not about scripted programs, and that's a national curriculum. It, it, that blows my mind every time I think about it. Yeah. What? Oh. 
No, which James is going to say something. A long time ago, it seems like a long time ago because it was uh, only 1985. <laughs> a little book was published by IRA called uh, Occupational Literacy Education. I was the first author, Alvin Mull and Becky Storm were the other authors. We looked at the literacy practices of 30 workers in 10 different occupations, technical occupations. And what we found was that on average, People read three hours a day in little snips that supports their work. That the context in which they apply literacy is more important than literacy. We asked their employers, you know, how important is reading ability in your occupation? And they would say, well, it's important, you know, people do it, they have to learn their jobs. But when they're on their jobs, typically, they read the same stuff every day. They read safety instructions, they read manuals, they, they read rulers more than they read text. So I, I guess what I'm saying is, it's all in context. It has to be meaningful. And it may not be the fact that uh, someone can summarize a, a you know, five paragraphs e essay that's important. It may be that they can follow written instructions without making a mistake that caused someone else an injury or their lives. Thank you. You know, the, the thing that I, I think I find kind of devastating is that the comments, Steve, that you made were written about in the 1960s. You know, Jonathan Kozloff's first book. That's how old I am. Yeah. <laughs> well, me too. And Jonathan, at an early age, yep. was written about black kids in Boston schools in the 1960s. And, and um, I don't know that we've come a long way. And that, that sounds so awful to come to say, right, at this point. but. But I think that we know what to do. I think that we know how to do this. And yet we get overwhelmed by the demands on us. I, I read recently a phrase that I absolutely love. Um, called, the, the phrase is fragile knowledge. And it, and it, and it was in the context of um, novice teachers who leave our universities very often having been well prepared and ready to take on the world and then they get into their classroom and their school settings and they're so overwhelmed by the mandates that they fall back into teaching the way they learned themselves as kids, or teaching the way the teacher next door is teaching, and they leave us with fragile knowledge, and, and, and figuring out some way to deepen that knowledge to make it less fragile, I think is, for those of us in teacher education, maybe one of the most important tasks we have. I think you're right. I still remember um, my first year of teaching uh, because I was terrified, absolutely terrified. And I have good reason to be. Um, I don't know that you can teach somebody everything they need to know in four years. No, until you get in that classroom, you have to do it yourself. And um, I remember being told by my, here's a really bad story to tell about myself, but I guess I'll do it since I've already started down this road. Um, my principal called me and he said, you're the worst teacher I ever saw. If you don't do something, you're going to be looking for a job in June. And I just thought, oh my God, this is all I've ever wanted to do. And now I'm bad at this. So I went to I went to a colleague who was teaching in middle school, and I said, what am I doing wrong? And she said, well, what's your goal? Now, I remember I'm a first, grade, first year teacher. And I said, I want to behave. I wanted to sit down and shut up and do what I tell them. <laughs> and she said, well, there's your problem. I said, well, excuse me? 
I want him to behave and that's my problem? She said, no. Nah, your problem is that your goal is to have them behave. Nobody hired you to babysit. They hired you to teach science. That's what you want to be doing. Are you having any fun? I said, oh my Lord, I'm miserable. She said, well, there you have it. Do something. Now notice, all this time, I've just been told I'm doing it wrong, but nobody said, here's what you need to do instead. And so I went back to my classes that next Monday, not knowing whether I could really do this or not. I took the grades that I had carefully recorded in pencil because I wasn't really sure about them when I did record them. And I ripped everything out. It was only after I ripped the grades out that I noticed that little fine print that said defacing this document <laughs> could result in three years in federal prison or whatever it said. But I, well, I'm, you know, in for a penny in for a pound. So I pulled it out and I said, guys, we got to start all over. Because you're not learning science and I'm not having any fun. And so we've got to figure out how to learn in this classroom I was teaching in the janitor's closet, by the way. Because I had an open toilet and a sink there. And since I was teaching science, that was my water. Um, and we made up, we came up with our own rules in every class. And from that point on, everything worked. Because my goal, my purpose, was to teach them science. And because my purpose changed, my outlook changed. I think, you know, those are things that that we don't tell pre-service teachers. And when you get into a situation where, wow, I have all this data I've got to figure out what to do with, and I have all these classes or all these subjects I have to teach, it is overwhelming. And I think if we stopped, if we started teaching for knowledge, science, if we started teaching for knowledge instead of teaching for fluency or for phonemic awareness or for, now we need all of those things mm -hmm. to get the knowledge. Right. But our primary purpose in our classrooms and perhaps most especially in our reading lessons mm -hmm. is not to get knowledge. It's to get better at reading. And it's killing us. And that reminds me of uh, when I taught here. There has been a great change in the emphasis. It's been on fluency, which I call speed reading. And I get in trouble when I do that. <laughs> but um, they call the kids out and they have them read for three minutes and they see how many words a minute they can read. Don't you think that's speed reading? They call it fluency and uh, the goals keep going up. And I felt like I was in the animal farm thing, you know, where the rules changed because one year the fifth graders had to read 150 words at the end of the year. The next year. Is that a minute? Yeah, 150 words a minute. And then the next year the fifth graders had to read 150 words at the beginning of the year. I was like, wait a minute. I was here last year, and I have the documentation. It was 150 words uh, at the end of the year last year. Now it's at the beginning, and if they can't, then they're at risk, you know. And so I got the kids who couldn't read very fluently, but man, did they comprehend because they would stop in the middle of a sentence, always in the middle of a paragraph, and they would go, "Oh, that reminds me of," or "Oh." Wow, do you think he's going to do this? You know, they'd be predicting, and they couldn't read the whole paragraph because they were thinking so deeply and comprehending. However, they were considered failing readers, and people would tell me if they don't read 150 words a minute fluently, then they won't be able to comprehend. That was, no, it was not true. They were comprehending way better than the kids were reading 150 words. I had some kids. They could read 175 words a minute and never tell you a thing they read. Right this minute, Joni, I am so thankful that I was out of school by the time they started that. Because I am like the world's slowest reader. No kidding. I probably couldn't read 150 words a minute. I could I cannot, I'm not a fast reader. And make it an academic journal article? 
When you have to reread the same sentence five times to make oh, sense yeah, of it? Yeah, absolutely. Or just before going to bed, if you're, you know, having some that's that's what we choose. Can, can I do we do have we have something career other people want to say things? Okay, and I'll say this really quick. I would tell the kids, go into this test, it's only one minute, and read it as fast as you can. Because then they won't mark you as being a low reader and then we can read. <laughs> I I'm a teacher for the deaf, and so teaching these kids the multimodal brain oh. is the best way for them. But this fluency test that they require them to do, I have a student that recently read 150 words a minute, was clueless about what he was reading. A couple of words would stand out um, as far as, oh, I want to make a connection, and we had to refocus him back in. But what was interesting is that the, the classroom teacher said, Oh, well, that's wonderful that you can read that many words in that short of time. And I said, but he has no clue what's going on because it's a cold read, has no background knowledge. And that background knowledge for their fluency read is so important for the comprehension. If they have never seen anything to do with that topic, they are going to get the questions wrong even if he did make connections, because he had no personal connection with the topic. Mm -hmm. I think this um, all goes back to what something that Jeannie said, and that's evidence. It's the kind of evidence we're asking for, for reading, yeah. You, I'm, I'm reminded of a kid um, who, I, some years ago, I listened to read a whole story that read the entire story fluently and exactly. And I said, Nina, tell me what the story was about. And I, I'm quoting her. She says, how can I tell you what the story was about? I was too busy reading the words. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, yes, question or not? Yeah, I was, oh, this is fun. <laughs> I better quiet down my teacher voice. Okay, but I, it's kind of a comment slash question, but back to the evidence that we're looking at, I don't know if anybody uses Lit First as their fluency testing, but I'm required in my district to do that. And so any of my fifth grade students who are performing NWA RIT score at 40th percentile or lower, then I have to administer a fluency test, and then throughout the year they have to pass the fluency test. But what is the correlation between how fast they can read and then whether or not they're performing at 40th percentile or above or below? There's there's not, right? In NWA, it's about comprehension. It's about being able to read something and being able to answer questions. Who made that decision? <laughs> I think, you know, I just said in my class on Wednesday night, until we start collecting multiple forms of evidence, collecting with, you know, to, to be very disrespectful, collecting the dumb things people make us collect, and then the other stuff that we know really tells us something, until we start collecting it all, the dumb stuff's gonna rule us. But I'm hoping, I'm hoping that maybe after 12 years of being so focused on standardized test scores, people are realizing that what really counts in the 21st century is not being able to go in and, and having an answer for a question that is supposed to have one and only one right answer. When's the last time you had a really important question that had one and only one right answer? My, gra my grandson, who's in third grade and read all of the Chronicles of Narnia this summer, came home in the second week of school with a worksheet with questions on it that he couldn't answer. His mother, who has a doctoral degree, couldn't answer, and they called me and, and scanned the pages and sent them to me, and I couldn't answer them. And we said, there's something wrong with this, you know. Yeah, but can you read 150 words? <laughs> You're an awesome reader if you can. Well, I so had a college student this week tell me that tell the whole class that she loved to read until she had to do book reports. And then she hated to read, and now is starting to finally get back into loving reading. So last spring, I was working um, with a fourth grade teacher in her class.
class, primarily Spanish English bilingual students. And we were um, just playing around, uh, experimenting with different ways of integrating technology into our curriculum. And one of the, the things that we did is the kids created um, a digital uh, newscast where we were using images from, the, from around the world, nationally and locally. So they would select, um, I'm sure you've all seen like NBC News, the weekend pictures. So it was something similar to that. So they would um, select the image, read the caption, close, very close reading of the caption and kind of deconstruct what that caption meant. In some cases, they would then read um, additional information about it. And they would take the, that information and they were, each of them were in pairs as news reporters, so they'd be reporting from, um, did you know there's an ugly bulldog contest in Missouri? <laughs> so that was one of the images that, was, uh, that they were drawn to. But they, so with their partner, they, would, they each had their post-it notes and they would jot down what they were going to say and then they would read that repeatedly which we know is something that's important for fluency. And then when we filmed, then I would film them, but of course then they had to talk to the camera. They had to introduce themselves. You know, here we are, we're at the reasonable book conference, blah, 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 blah. And then one of the things that I asked them to add to their news report was something about the power of the image. Um, and across the, 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 the snippets, as we were videotaping, <coughs> We would shoot it, they would immediately look at it, and they'd say, oh, okay, we have to do that again. And they would typically, I mean, if I didn't stop them, um, I would usually, if they did it five or six times, that was where I would say, okay, it's a wrap. That's the, that's the best one. I wove it together in one news show, and we integrated some local news and some other things. Well, <clears throat> the teacher was, when we presented the, the news show, um, the teacher literally, who was like a hardcore veteran teacher, 25 years, no nonsense kind of teacher, wonderful, literally had tears in her eyes and she um, shared it with the principal. And what the principal was so impressed with was she said, they're so fluent in their oral expression. <laughs> you know, and that fluency in oral expression came from repeated reading and the translation then of that information into their own. Uh, words, but that desire to practice and practice and practice was coming from a real purpose. They wanted to look good and sound good on video. Um, and it's the same kind of um, mechanism that's happening in the video project where they're reading because they have a purpose for it. And it's the experiencing, the creating, the. And we like to create. We need more, more opportunities to make stuff and create. They're engaged, and they're they're the ones that are presenting. So they have an audience for it, and that's big. Having an audience is yeah. huge. Well, and I think that just points to the importance of considering the purpose for whatever you're doing, whether it's reading. Bridget and I were having a, a little discussion, a side discussion. We were buzzing together, and what you were saying that there were times when you went to print the word first. Right. I mean, there's something unique for, unique about written language in terms of um, the density of the language and the complexity of the ideas that can be communicated and often communicated very efficiently if you're a skilled reader. And so, for me, if I'm doing a news check, to watch the video will take too long. For me. Uh -huh. and so I will read um, rather than watch the video. But if I want to... Um, learn a cooking procedure, I don't read the explanation. I mean, I go on YouTube and find the video. Well, that's, that's me. I, you know, I was telling Bridget, I had uh, made a quilt and had to do 96 password triangles. And the day I finished the last triangle, I found a video on YouTube showing how you could make eight of them at a time and one fell swoop. <laughs> I think that goes back to what Jean said earlier about context. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's all about context. So much of what we, what we've been taught to do, and what we continue to do, um, part of it is that we're comfortable because you know this is the way I learned how to do it. So this is the way I'm comfortable teaching it. Um, but but now what, what's happening is that 
you know, the comment back there about the fluency, what, what relationship does fluency have to this other, you know, where's the 40 percent, who decided this? It's all decontextualized. And without that, there's no, there's no meaning to it, there's no purpose to it, there's no engagement with it, um, and not just, not just for the students, but also for the teachers. And I think that, you know, the, the context becomes tremendously important. I want to bring up the dirty word. Okay. Standards. I don't think that's a dirty word. word. It shouldn't be. But listening to Bridget describe this project, well, that because it's a dirty word. But the standards are. I can connect that project to lots of wonderful yeah. stuff. As you kept talking through that project, because this is what I do with our teaching technology class, I emphasize the project based learning mm -hmm. and how can we use that as an assessment mechanism. And I'm sitting here as you're talking about that project, and I'm like, okay, I just, we just hit at least five ISC student standards, at least three teacher ISC standards. I can probably start jotting down a half a dozen or more ELA Common Core standards that we've hit in this one lesson. Mm -hmm. Yet, it's not an acceptable evidence of learning. Well, I, I think it's certainly acceptable for teachers. For us, yes. Yeah, I just, I, I think I think one of the things we have to do as teachers is educate the public. But we've been so busy stretching the slim resources we have, we don't have time to do it all. Yeah, and, and I guess I want to step back a little bit from, from what some of you said to say. There's a lot of good stuff going on in the wild. Oh, yeah, there is. There, I mean, yeah, there are tremendously yeah. courageous teachers yeah. who, against yeah. all odds, are making huge differences for kids. Yeah. And I, yeah, and I think in too many cases we have teachers that are laboring under really stressful conditions. And, um, and and doing courageous work that way. It's almost eight o'clock. I'm going to ask each member of the panel to just make one last comment. What would you say about our discussion? What would you want people to leave with? And then we'll ask for any comments from the audience. You want to start? Oh, I guess he's going to finish. I, I'm going to go back to the very first thing that we talked about. Um, I still believe that reading is constructing meaning. And I think um, the examples that we just talked about with the really awesome and cool projects that are happening in our classrooms are all about that. How, how do we get meaning out of everything around us? And not only do we construct it for ourselves, but how do we construct it for others? I, I think that sort of relationship of not only what do we take in about the world around us, but how do we, um, to, to kind of go back to what um, Roy was saying about communication, uh, my immediate thought to that was you communicate with someone, that's something that's sort of outward, reciprocal, um, and literacy, I think, is a little bit more about taking in the world and then communicating it back. I, I'm not really sure where I am on that, but I, I think that's an interesting thing and maybe something that will be explored more tomorrow in some of our sessions about what is that relationship and how does it work. But I do think it's all about meaning. I guess I want to pick up on um, something that Bridget talked about, and that's the authenticity of the task. And in, in many ways, I think it all starts there. But if, if as teachers we think about the importance of the task, but, you know, it, is the task worthy of being done when we ever do it outside of classroom? I often say to my own students, the only time you do this task is in your classroom. You've chosen the wrong task. So starting with authenticity of task may be, for me, is a big, a really big important point. I agree with that. Um, and I think, I think we need to trust ourselves. Um, you are doing a lot of good stuff. And, and so I think you, you build on that. You know, if it's, if it's interesting to you, chances are it's gonna, you're going to make it interesting for your students, right? The more passionate we are, the more engaged they're going to be. Um, you know, so, so trust that you're doing some things well. And, and kind of maybe just take a step back and say, 
you know, maybe I'm already doing some of these things that, that count as, as multi-moral literacy. Um, you know, it just doesn't all have to be the bells and whistles of technology. Technology takes a lot of different forms. A pencil is technology. Um, so look at what you're already doing, and don't feel like you have to reinvent the wheel. My thought after listening to everyone, and even going back to Ray's early slides with all the different pictures for different variations and means of literacy, is to think about how we can weave these together. So as you attend your different sessions tomorrow, as you go to the workshops, how can you weave these together to create one engaging activity versus three or four little pockets of things that you're doing here and there? I'm going to uh, make it fun for you and for the students and make it memorable. Um, I love the 12 page uh, reading curriculum in New Zealand. I think we should go to that because you can integrate literacy into math and social studies and science and um, make it memorable for the kids and make it interesting and you can address most of the standards in one project like that. Don Liu, who's a, a leading scholar in New Literacies, um, wrote, I think it was a piece for the reading teacher many years ago, where, he's, where he talked about the importance of preparing, as literacy teachers, the importance of preparing our students for their literacy futures, which of course means preparing them for their life's futures. And so bottom line for me is an issue of equity. Um, so we have to kind of do what's right for kids, which means that we've got to expand what we mean by literacy. And I think a key um, level for that is expanding how we assess so that it's feasible um, and usable and that we're not drowning in data that's not making a difference for a lot of kids. And I would probably say that for me, um, the authenticity of task and the authenticity of purpose, that, that purpose and task and to consider the audience, and wherever possible, to have an audience outside of the classroom, um, to me, really makes a difference. Anybody have parting words or comment or question to consider? Can I see? Oh, that's okay. Oh, good. One thing I think, um, as a teacher, is the fact that people don't let us make the judgments. They set the rules, they say we have to meet it, and yet many of us know when, when kids come to school, they come with knowledge, they come as visual learners. We are then told we have to meet these requirements, and we change them. We spend most the first two years of school, getting ready to take the tests, getting ready to do this, and we take it away the month that they come to school with that's vision learning. I hope that as you go through tomorrow, you'll talk with each other lots, you'll um, find something really useful, and that, as Ray said earlier, when you go back to your schools, you'll share, because that to me is the strength of teachers. You don't um, you don't get better as a teacher by hoarding what you're doing. You get better when you share. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. And we'll see you in the morning.